Welcome back to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Today we're honored to be joined by Natalie Rosat, M I E S. She is the founder of Photoscope, a think tank on light. She is a New York based photo tech and the recipient of many prestigious awards, grants, fellowships, and sponsorships, including a 2021 WIL award for the Global Solar Lighting Initiative, Lightreach. She has a strong track record of contributions to social and critical issues in lighting and to the lighting and design education areas. These include international keynote presentations, speaking engagements, and publications, as well as a part-time professorship at the New School, former engagements as senior thesis faculty in lighting design master's programs, senior guest lecturer in landscape architect master's programs in Versailles and Lille, an education columnist for the IES's publication LDNA. Foscope.org, lightreach.net, and then social media will be listed on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. But before we do, we have to get a grip on something else, Greg Garrett, Gri- Grip Lock Thank Systems. You. Go to G R P L O C K S Y S T E M S dot com. I did it. <laughs> uh, you kind of did it. I told you not to spell it because you missed the I between the R. It's oh, the P, but man. that's okay. Grip lock. But hey, from the ceiling down to the fixture, they provide everything you need to suspend your light fixture. The key key component is a unique self-locking, completely adjustable device that can lock onto a long range of air force or aircraft cables and no tools. You can adjust it up and down as often as you'd like. Labor saving installation, they have in-house engineers, and they check every product they send out, safety and quality control. Made right here. Grip lock systems. No chains. Go to griplocksystems.com, folks. And, of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Is this podcast going to be out before the convention, Greg? Oh, it's going to be tight. Tight. Scott question. I think it might be. Okay. Well, we're going to be in Dallas. Was it 17th through 19th, something like that? September coming up quick. Ooh, that came up fast. Be there or be square. Natalie, welcome to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You know, uh, thanks for coming on. I think the, the first question I have changed when Mike read the bio, bio on you. Um, what is a photo tech? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a profession of one <laughs> at the moment. Um, the idea is that if somebody tells me I'm an architect, I can say I'm a photo tech. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that was the beginning of Foscope. Um reclaiming the Greek root of light, photo. When you say photo, everybody thinks photography. And I think that we are really missing out in in our industry because that should be our root. Um, So I I really thought that to speak about uh, phototecture as opposed to lighting design, which I've always thought was kind of a weak term mm. um really sets the sets the turn um so it it became as a i mean again that was at the beginning of Foscope, and that word um you know led to a whole lexicon uh, which people can find on the website if they're interested but i was really hoping it would actually catch up uh more than it did because i think that it's should be an attractive term to more than me. <laughs> yeah, Why you know, lighting... hang on, I just want to get into this yeah. a little bit. Everyone and no one is a lighting designer. I mean, there is the IALD and I respect their practice and their certifications and that sort of stuff. But like a lighting, you're right, the lighting design term is thrown around a lot. And it's kind of to the point of, you know, where it's difficult to know what actually a lighting designer is. And if, and really an interior designer, really their primary thing is light. If they're doing interior design, they need light, right? So I found it to be an awkward term as well. Um, and it's interesting that you've you've changed how you refer to yourself to photo tech. So I find that fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think also, if I may just add, um, you know, Foscope was born out of a reaction against a very architecture-centric world. And I really wanted to take a photocentric um, position. Uh, let's look at the design world. Let's look at environments from a lighting standpoint. And I thought that you cannot do that from 
you know, if you're called a lighting designer. So mm. <laughs> I thought photo texture really established um, the the uh, the position a lot better. Yeah, and I guess that, that was going to be my question is why you felt it's a weak term, but I think you you kind of answered there. I mean, do you, do you feel like the term should be changed? Make that stance right now? Oh, absolutely. I thought that the term should be changed like over 10 years ago. Why isn't it caught on? That's an interesting question. I don't know. Hmm. It caught on with me, so I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, how did you, I guess, uh, how did you get into lighting? Uh, I guess by accident, in in a way, uh, I had been trained as a, I was trained as a designer, um, worked in, actually as an interior designer, but that's pretty much the only field in which I never practice. I worked in um, architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, product design, um, exhibit design, both in Paris and in New York. And um, I ended up um, working, I, I, at some point I was doing some freelance work and uh, I um, had a client who needed somebody to do renderings and turned out to be a lighting design company in New York. Uh, so I actually got into lighting design through drawing. Um, and I really fell in love with it because, uh, I mean, first of all, I think it's a very beautiful way to get into the field um, because I had to understand um, the technical aspects from the effects that I was drawing. Uh, and, and that's something that I've always, um, throughout my teachings afterwards, that's something that I've always kept as a, as a good process uh, to learn lighting. And, um, you know, I realized pretty quickly that it was, uh, lighting was about design, it's about uh, technology, it's about science, and I was never somebody who needed to um, build concrete, you know, projects in concrete. So in many ways, it was sort of the perfect, uh, I felt it was the perfect match. And, and then it, because it was also relatively and uh, developed discipline in the sense that it's a young discipline. I felt that it also offered a lot of opportunities for uh, theoretical explorations. So it's, I started in 20, in, uh, yeah, around 2000 and uh, I never left. Hmm. I, you know, one of the things that when I was doing my research for this um, photo tech, when I was doing the research for the show, Greg, is I noticed that the Foscope website uses much different terminology. I'm going to read um, a, se a, se a sentence or two from their mission statement. I'm going to ask Natalie to comment on it, okay? So complex lighting ecologies, that's something I've never heard before, a lighting ecology, are integral to the cultural history of our varying and evolving constructed environments, forms, and functions. Yet... Issues of light and lighting have been co-opted, Greg Eric, to date. They've been co-opted by energy requirements, architectural practices, and marketing strategies, and reduced to performance, technology, and luminaires. I think that is so true, Natalie. Explain to me, like, it's almost like, I feel like the lighting industry is being abused by utilities or energy efficiency programs as a way to, the only place that they can actually get mitigation. It's like, oh, we need to reduce our energy consumption. Do more lighting, right? To make lighting more energy efficient. And they can't get any action anywhere else. And so they keep coming to lighting to reduce its energy consumption. I think we've carried that torch for 25 years now or longer, maybe 40 years. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Tell me about how that, that mission statement and how you guys decided to use those kinds of terms and how did it get co-opted? There's a bunch of questions in that. Well, I, I think it gets co-opted. Um... <laughs> You're making me question the, the wording of the, of the mission statement. Um, you know, I just think it doesn't stand 
strongly enough by itself, and I go back to you know the phototexture uh, statement. If you lighting is very, I mean, in many lighting designers will keep saying, well, there's architecture first. We serve architecture. We serve landscape architecture. Uh, and I actually really question that. Um, you're, you know, you maybe have convinced already because you're saying there's no interior design without lighting design. And uh, in many ways that applies to, you know, color selections and texture selections mm -hmm. and finish selections and so forth and so on. So why not expand this further uh, and really make uh, burn lighting in a standalone, you know, equal field uh, of design. I've worked in numerous large-scale projects where they were uh, probably up to 10 consultants, architecture, landscape architecture, urban, ecology, you know. Um, there is always an assumption that the lead of those projects is going to be a landscape architect or an architect. I think it's very conceivable that we could in a world where the lead is um, the photo tech, um, because of everything that that entails in terms of the design and so forth and so on. And when you take that standpoint, then you're not just looking at efficiency issues. You're not the the reduced by the other domains to, well, you have to light that space and you have to comply with. Uh, energy requirements and you have to comply with, which I think we are all, um, you know, far too ready to agree with. And, and you know, we are not fighting that enough. Uh, one of the things that, as you may have seen as well, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going around here, but without answering directly your question, maybe I find it's a better way to actually answer it. I work with solar lighting quite a bit. Um, Solar lighting, outdoor solar lighting is off grid. That's the main um, quality of solar lighting because, in many ways, the energy efficiency is not all that important if you're looking at low uh, energy or low consumption sources, right? On the other hand, if you look at wired uh, lighting, imagine that a few years from now we have a Energy is no, no energy efficiency is not an issue. Let's imagine a world where um, we have affordable, highly efficient renewable energy. Mm -hmm. What does it do to our whole focus and obsession with um, energy efficient lighting? Was that do we need that in order to justify, you know, going back or not giving up? Um, conventional sources like incandescent and so forth and so on. It's, I think that we are just being pushed, we, but we are willingly doing that as a, mm. as a whole profession. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're being bossed around by other people's priorities. Um, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. The other thing is, um, you know, uh, you made a point there about energy. I, I think we need, we need clean abundant cheap as much electricity as we want to use and clean and cheap like we should have as much as we want to use this poverty mindset that's captured uh you know almost every area of lighting that we have to energy efficiency lower lower reduce energy consumption reduce energy consumption i would like to see the utilities come back and say actually we built these wonderful plants here and the energy is cheap and you can use as much of it as you want um, and, uh, like, I don't understand the poverty mindset that's entered the lighting industry. I think we need to adopt an abundance mindset, um, maybe as a society that the, you know, the universe has everything we need, um, and we can, we can achieve it by technological innovation. But I think it starts with, to me, everything starts with clean energy. Yes. Natalie, did we lose you? Are you there? No, no, oh. I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, no, I, I agree. Um, but I think that the, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not saying that if we don't have um, 
that you know cheap clean energy available right now that it's not a good idea to be economical with how we use lighting or mm -hmm. how we use energy rather agree. Uh, and electricity but i think that the in many ways the the i mean that's what the training is by design and that's what we should always claim uh Lighting experts, uh, not to say you know, lighting designers, should work with the minimum, always. Um, only use what you need to in order to get um, what you want to achieve. Mm. So I think that it's, um, you know, we are, as a profession in the design field, there's an imposition from other fields, and in terms of you know absolute savings, uh, possibly all those measures and policies do save energy. But I always like to look at the relative. What about you know other building systems? What about other uh, urban systems? How do we compare to that, given the uh, return investment that you know good lighting brings to people in spaces yeah so on your full scope we've talked to, about here you establish it to facilitate change in the practice education and critical study of lighting why why is change needed i know we've talked a little bit why specifically what was the moment where you said i need to do this because we're doing it all wrong I mean, it's just to continue on what we were talking about, I think that um, the practice of light right now is very much, um, or the, the design practice of light is very much done um, within the world of um, architectural design. And, and I think that we, could, we, we can earn a stronger uh, position in the, in the constructed environment. Um, you know, I, our discipline is also, I mean, again, it's a young discipline, it's very uh, practice-oriented, it's very commercial and technology-driven, uh, um, and it doesn't have a whole lot of critical study um, under its belt. Um, so I go back to, I think there are a lot of opportunities to do that. and. It's it's just it's a fact that it will help us establish um, a stronger discipline if we have a stronger uh, critical discourse in it. I, I have zero doubt about that. What is a critical um, discourse? Explain that to me exactly. I see that here in your bio, critical issues and social. Explain what a critical discourse is. Critical discourse is um, you basically question. Um, you question everything, you question, you look at, I mean, it's analysis and, and um, of current practices, current technologies, you look at the, uh, the history of it, you look at um, the social implication of common practices, and you put them in a, you know, you can put them in a different context. Um, or you compare them with, I go back to the absolute versus relative, very often we think of lighting in terms of absolute, but then if you're looking at certain lighting issues uh, in the context of other issues, um, that really opens up new ways of thinking about it and, and looking at it differently. I'm, I'm very tempted as much as I think that uh, I may be opening Pandora's box here, uh, because I know that you're fervent followers of and and uh, um, of of dark skies, um, I apply that to light pollution as well. I really think that we need to put um, light pollution as a theme, as a topic, as a very complex one, um, within the larger context of uh, environmental pollution. Um, it's because right now we are, I hear a lot of discussion and a lot of, uh, very passionate, um, advocacy for uh, dark sky and, and against light pollution. 
that is much more emotionally driven than data driven. Mm -hmm. um, and we are not going to mm -hmm. get the research that we need and to have the knowledge that we need if we do not uh, recognize that and if we do not really articulate a whole research agenda uh, that will give us the information that we need to really analyze this. There's nothing wrong with being nostalgic. I'm I'm like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I love a starry sky. Um, but I think that light pollution is also some what the eyes sees. Um, we don't see airborne pollution unless it's lit by <laughs> light pollution. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've said you know, somewhat productively sometimes that I am more in favor of light pollution because of what it actually does. We don't see waterborne pollution. It doesn't mean that it's not there and doesn't harm mm -hmm. people. And and again, in terms of comparatively, uh, how bad is light pollution on, uh, how bad is the impact on bad on of light pollution on the global environmental uh, and ecosystems. Well, nobody we can know. answer that question. Yeah, nobody can answer that question um, because it's the the field is so fragmented into different areas. The the darkness restoration and night preservation space. I don't even like you're a person of terms. I don't like the term dark sky. It's very difficult to translate into other languages. It doesn't make sense in other in some languages to say dark sky to translate that. It doesn't have a call to action in it. And um, you actually want bright skies filled with stars. Like you don't actually want dark skies. Dark skies are bad. You want lots of stars in the sky. So the terminology, the way we talk about it, um, the average person in the public and most of the people in the environmental movement, other environmental movements, would see light pollution as a metaphor. That it's not really pollution. It's just we're using pollution as a metaphor to describe excess light at night. And that, I think that's totally wrong. I think light pollution is 100% a, um, sorry, my lights just went off here and on again, folks. Um, <laughs> light pollution is, yeah, light pollution is pollution and it causes all, ma and it's got to the point where it's grotesque now, Natalie. I think a lot of people, including myself, look at light pollution as, you know, gone from, you know, um, I made a point there, what was, uh, it went from conspicuous to grotesque. Like it's light pollution is disgusting now. You when it's going into the ocean, two miles out, deep into the water, it's in people's car lights and street lights. It's very, it's absolutely awful. But there's no, there isn't really a um, you know, sort of a hub. Well, Carolina Zelinska Dabkowska is working on sort of a uh, or has finished a um, literature review of all of the current literature on light pollution and what it says. Even then, who's the leader in that field, Natalie? Who's in charge of that? Is it Dark Sky International or, or is it, you know, who's in charge? Who's the leader? Is there any government no. organizations, you know what I mean, that are interested in it? It's tough to find. Yeah, yeah but I, I guess what I'm saying is we, we have to be, I mean, I don't think that there's such a thing as all the literature right now because they are, um, you know, they, they are, so many ways to find information. I mean, I, I'll just give you one example. A couple of years ago, just because I, it's it's really a topic that I'd like to use for Scope as a platform um, to discuss. Uh, I think we need more of those discussions. Uh, you, we've seen countless um, reports or comments on, you know, the, the, I'm going to sound awfully cynical, but uh, the little turtles that uh, that die, and it seems to be zillions of turtles, according to those um, reports, that will die, and and basically it's all because of light pollution. Well, one year we had an intern, and I decided to just dig into this. Um, so we actually counted turtles. We looked at the global turtle population that hatches at night, which is now the majority of turtles. And then we looked at um, the percentage of the total populations in Florida, where, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think 90% of the U.S. Um, night hatching turtles uh, allocated, and Australia, which is also very aggressive in terms of, um, you know, turtle-friendly uh, lighting devices. Um, 
So that came down to 17%. Those two areas that host, you know, the vast majority of um, of the turtles is 17% uh, of the global night hatching turtle populations. When you look, I, I'm not saying that, and then you can also find out that the main prime cause of death is dune reconstruction. Um, I think I remember that fishing nets is second. And light, you know, light at night and disorientation um, comes at least third, uh, mm. if not further down. And then you look at, well, why is there lighting? Very often it's because there's new development. So lighting is actually attached to, uh, it's a circumstantial. Um, mm. It's maybe the development is what we should question, not the lighting. And just like energy efficiency, we seem to be very willing to be the culprit here, um, just because um, light is what the eye sees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand what, what, you're, what you're saying by stepping back from the issue and looking at the, uh, the light pollution from a perspective of how did it get there in the first place. Um, and then measuring, you know, what has a greater impact on turtles, dune reconstruction or light pollution. It's an interesting way. What are some other social and uh, critical issues that are important to you? Well, one, one project that um, uh, I've been working on for a few years and uh, has been picking up in the past year or so is uh, dermatology. So dermatology is, I mean, again, I, I use the words, you know, for Scopes lexicon all the time. So uh, photology uh, was not invented by Foscope. Photology is actually the science of light. And dermatology is the science of light and skin. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I, I started that project because I have a friend who is a beautiful singer. And she was um, one time... Um, performing in a fairly dark restaurant and uh, she's dark skin and so was her musician and you basically couldn't see them. So as a good, uh, I can't remember if I was a photo tech already, I think I was, uh, I decided I'm going to create a little light fixture that she can put in her purse and uh, hook, hook up wherever she goes. Um, I mean, I like to play with, you know, miniature uh, of creatures, so I pretty much already had some uh, some accessories. Um, and the question was, um, you know, what should be the uh, the spectral distribution? So I go in, and like uh, I believe a lot of people would have gone. Actually, a lot of people have done from <laughs> based on what I've heard. Uh, I tried different filters with my little, you know, portable light, and I started with amber. And Amber did not look good on Vienna. Uh, so I tried a few more filters, and then I did, suddenly Lavender was, oh, the, her skin was coming alive. Mm. And that really took me by surprise. And I thought, well, you know, we, we go with Amber, Straw, that's our default. That's what even, uh, you know, my generation, we were not formally trained lighting designers. But um, through practice, that's pretty much what we know. And I thought, there was something there that I had never heard. And then I started looking it up and it turns out that photographers who photograph people of colors um, are giving, you know, those kind of, some resources with those kind of tips, you know, lavender, blues, pink, um, for skin of color. And I realized, well, has our industry actually ever looked at um, spectral distribution, uh, or, you know, I always prefer the chromaticity approach than uh, color temperature, but have we ever thought of this uh, and controlled it for um, skin tone? And I, it's very clear that we haven't. And when you expand the, that research, again, put this in, in context, uh, in a wider context, in theatrical lighting, uh, there's been an acknowledgement um, that you really had to um, 
change your palette uh, when you were lighting different, um, you know, skin tones. Uh, cinematography uh, has also um, done some progress because the whole history of, of film technology um, was based on um, fair tone um, standards. So when you start looking at it, it's, it's not necessarily an intentional bias, but there is a long history of bias that's built in technology. Um, and I thought that, well, we need to look at this in architectural lighting as well. So that was, um, so I started this about five years ago, and then my friend started performing online, you know, in 2020. Um, and clearly there was, um, so we did some more tests and, and I worked with her a little more. Um, but other things happened in, in the U.S. in 2020 that led to uh, a greater interest in that line of inquiry. Uh, and I have to say that in the past year or so, there's definitely been um, much more interest. So now we're actually talking with uh, and meeting with uh, the IES uh, that has several uh, technical committees, uh, Committee on Color, um, you know, uh, the the because, for instance, the, the, they recognized the TM30 had not looked at uh, skin tone. Uh, and then there's video conferencing, and we are looking for industry partners so that we can really do some experiments and, um, you know, psycho, psychophysical studies to really get a sense of is there, is, how big is the problem, first of yeah, all? I was going to say, um, is it even a problem? Like, that would be my question. So the assertion here, and just correct me if I'm wrong, the assertion here is that architectural lighting, film, cin cinematic lighting, and theater lighting have been created in a manner to prefer the skin of Caucasians rather than people of other ethnicities? By default, yeah. But, like... Just, and because, so, nobody, and but just because nobody thought... That Caucasian skin was not the standard. Well, what I do don't. You thought about I, yeah, like nobody said, yeah, let's gear it to white people's skin so we we can mm -hmm. exclude other. I don't. I like I, I. And so, why is this a problem? Well, ask people who have darker skin tones than the three of us. They'll tell you. Well, what would they say? Like, I don't. I don't know what the see. Like when I go to a theater, I see the theater lighting. And it shines on people equally. And what the what the what the assertion here is is that it is very slightly tuned to favor Caucasian people, and it should be tuned back or changed to reflect other. No. I, I don't see this as really a problem. I don't know. I don't. I don't understand how it's like how it causes trouble. Like I, I see some of the other things, but. You know, so you next time you do a lighting system, you can you consider what race the people are going to be under it and tune it accordingly. Is that is that the is that the the idea? Like, what's the what's the solution to the problem? Okay, so at, at the risk of being uh, provocative, I I do not use the <laughs> the word race because oh, okay. it's uh you know it's been proven to be a a, a completely false um, framework. Um, you know, the, the, the history of pigmentation, uh, the evolution of pigmentation is actually pretty well established by uh, biologists today. Uh, it's all about uh, protection against UV, uh, against, you know, cell degeneration and um, the entrainment of the vitamin uh, D production. So mm -hmm. you can map it. And of course, you know, populations have uh, moved across the globe. So... Uh, now you have the, the, the mix that you have. Um, no, I'm, I'm not saying that... Um, it, well, theater is different. Uh, so let's, let's go... I'll, I'll start with theater and cinematography. You, you light a subject. Uh, a lot of us did not like and do not like the way they look in con with conventional light sources. Again, there's been major progress um, in, in those fields because people have really experimented and found 
better, uh, more flattering um, spectral distribution, but also it's not just the spectral distribution, it's also the light distribution. You know, you have issues of specularity, you have, uh, you, you create contrasts in different ways, depending on uh, the uh, level of the intensity of the pigmentation of the skin. So you have, um, it's it's like a, you know, a tool, um, a kit that you learn, and once you know that, you can really use it and apply it to different people. When it comes to architectural lighting, people are not the subject of architectural lighting. Mm -hmm. Usually the environment is. Mm -hmm. However, um, I am, just to give you an example, I'm in a conference room, there's general lighting. Uh, I'm on a screen, you're looking at me, it's going to be streamed on a website. If my skin turn were different, and I don't know what I'm going to look like, but my skin tone were uh, different, I might find that I look very green and yellow on your website, and it might upset me, and possibly rightfully so, just because in the light sources that I have in this room, um, that light source works best for um, our kind of skin tone. Mm. So I think it's worth looking into. I, you know, to answer your question, I don't know how big the problem is. I don't know how easy the solution is. But I think it's worth acknowledging that it's something that we never thought. And in itself, that's uh, possibly. I think I think that's I think that's your greatest. I think that's part of what you're doing. Is it, it's not that it's not. What you're doing is questioning and seeing if some of these questions can take root at a deeper level and expand themselves into into research in different areas and into the practice. And whether or not that, that happens to any given extent is not really the point. Am I correct on that, Natalie? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's super interesting. <laughs> yeah, like you the, know, and I think... <laughs> I, I was gonna say I think it's it, it, that, that's what's needed right now in lighting because of where things are at and and I agree with questioning everything, but then my my question is always how is it ever going to get a result and how is it going to happen? It's only people like you that do the research and spend the time and the money. Why isn't anybody else doing this kind of thing in lighting? Who's leading this? Well, and that's it? why we are doing it. You know, that's why we are doing it with the IES. I mean, I have always, every time I speak about this project, um, and I speak about it every chance I get, uh, I think it's shared knowledge that we need. Um, and, you know, it's important to do this together. So I'm really happy that the IES is, is interested in working with us. I'd love to find industry partners. Uh, we, are, uh, we definitely need industry partners to, to push this further. Um, it's, uh, but our industry is, I go back to our industry is very practice, you know, very practice, practice driven and product driven and technology driven. So we need those kind of, um, topics as well, greater topics to bring another level of knowledge and that can really drive our, our practice. And I think that will really, um, help us you know, the role of our field and the recognition for our field. Mm. One, one other question, just on the Light Reach Network. You want to just touch on that quick, what that's all about? Sure. Um, you want me to explain where it came from or how it... Yeah, yeah just a summary of what it is and what you do there. Yeah. So so, I mean, I, I began Light Reach because I had uh, worked as a volunteer uh, with the French nonprofit Concept de Lumière Sans Frontières, which is Lighting Designers Without Borders, and when I um, when I volunteered, they were, they had a project in Haiti, uh, and coincidentally, the year I went, um, the client, which was a local nonprofit, asked us to look at an electrification uh, project that they had for uh, informal settlements. So, and that was, you know, about it, around 2013, I think. Um, 
when I got into lighting, I go back to the 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 idea that it, I felt there were so many opportunities for things to look at. Back in 2000, there were a lot of uh, urban planners, sociologists who were looking at informal settlements and uh, analyzing the habitat and, and the economy and the ecologies of urban settlements. Nobody was looking at it in terms of lighting. So I started doing some of that research and looking at theoretical uh, lighting solutions. Um, my interest in, in solar uh, powered lighting goes uh, way back. So um, by the time I was in Haiti in, with that question, I pretty much had a, you know, a turnkey solution for um, what I thought those environments uh, needed, and uh, I, I basically convinced them that I mean they were they they had a electrification project going on, but uh, given the the complicated state of um, infrastructure uh, in in Haiti. Um, to put it simply, I argued that uh, you know with solar uh, powered lighting we could act really fast mm. and at really low cost. Uh, so in the long term they could go with a wired solution, but in the meantime we could give them lighting very very fast. So I developed, you know, I applied basically a, a model that I had been um, uh, chewing on for a while and. Um, and that was a very replicable model. So based on that, I launched LightReach, which is very much, you know, it's a global initiative that uses uh, program based, um, that is program based, and the programs are multiple projects that are all based on the same template. There's a, a turnkey template. There's a model to work with uh, local partners. I mean, everything I've learned along the way, everything that works, how to do, how to actually do this, is in LightReach. Um, so we did a pilot uh, program in uh, Puerto Rico with three pilot projects. We were going to continue in 2020, uh, but you know we had some fundraisers uh, listed, and we were going to do at least three more projects, uh, but that uh, stopped. Uh, abruptly, and uh, however, in 2020, uh, we began working in Lebanon. We had to modify the model somehow uh, because of you know we couldn't send volunteers to uh, work with uh, communities, and um, the uh, program leader over there was uh, you know had to do a lot of that alone and and with volunteers we couldn't also do any training workshops education is a big part of of all of that um i i'm very keen on education i if i may just add as a um parenthesis that i an, another thing that foscop does is i i i do not agree with the make lighting simple, simplify the language approach to all. I think that uh, the of light is not rocket science. Uh, I've taught, you know, a spectrum to, uh, again, populations of varying ages and, and levels of education in Haiti, and, and people understand pretty quickly uh, why certain spectral distribution is good because they, they you know, they work at night, they do their crafts at night so that they can sell during the day. Uh, people understand those things really quickly. And I think that it's, uh, it would be better, we'd be better off <laughs> to uh, push for more science education at a younger age rather than uh, oversimplifying how we speak about light. I think we'd be much better off. But anyway, so... Um, yeah, we are. That's where we are. Uh, we are talking about now uh, launching a, a program in Turkey. Um, where we work is where there has been a natural human-made uh, disaster. We are not. Lightweight is not an emergency uh, program. We basically bring light to communities to support their. Uh, social and cultural lives. Uh, mm. I find that it's uh, so. For instance, in in Lebanon, uh, it's a bit hard to get information now, but we know that there's going to be container towns uh, in all those places. You know, 
anything informal is supposed to be temporary, but very often, especially in corrupt, uh, mm. you know, in, in countries so people where people are going to live in containers in Lebanon. That's what's going to happen after this port blast and the inflation and all this stuff. No, in Turkey. In, in Turkey, in Turkey, after the yeah. the earthquake, uh, there are probably yeah. already some uh, container uh, towns. That's what happens. And those solutions are supposed to be temporary. Government will, you know, or NGOs will put people in containers until there's some reconstruction effort. Problem is, um, those solutions tend to last. Um, and I think that with light, by lighting exterior spaces, um, you can really support people's social life and, and cultural life. I mean, in, in Puerto Rico, the pilot program was called um, Recreo de Noche. Uh, playing at night mm. because the vision was if you light a playground um the kids are going to go and play i mean all all those countries you know have in common that it's dark fairly early um late afternoon six or seven mm. so if you light a playground the kids are going to go and play the parents are going to go and hang out uh so it becomes a multi-generational space mm. uh and if you give people the tools to transform that space because there is some kind of festival or there is some kind of celebration uh, and you teach people how to manipulate and how to create accessories for the lighting that you bring, then you really empower people to have a quality exterior space. Um, it's, you know, we, we do, I mean, one of the things that I'm most proud of, I think, with Light Ridge is that we actually do... Um, landscape architectural lighting with um, utility lights that <laughs> are, are made for, you know, people to put on top of a, a barn door. Mm. Um, but we bring a design expertise and we, t we share that design expertise with people. We empower them with that. So uh, then it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, and it's, I think it's a great plus at the low cost. You know, the return mm -hmm. investment, I go back to that, is really quite high. And, you know, one of the things that I looked at before you came on and that I've been going through over the course of the show is the FOSS words. Is that how you would pronounce it? It's like a, a dictionary of new or, I guess, maybe different design terminology for to describe how inter light interacts with old age, for example. So you have gerophotic on the website there and that's your discuss I, I love that i think that that a whole set of terminology based on that is wonderful uh natalie do we have any final thoughts for the get a grip on lighting listeners from your perspective before we close the show hmm. um well i um Final thoughts, final thoughts. I think that we should be, they should be more photo texts. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, uh, pledge for uh, the industry to be more supportive of what Foscope is trying to do, really, uh, because I'm keen on um, the collective dimension of uh, seeking um, more knowledge and new knowledge. And I really... Um, hope to inspire, um, you know, people in the industry and in every size of the industry to um, to work with us and and to uh, and to bring new, you know, new projects that we can work on. So, well, it worked today. I'm inspired by you. And I'm pretty sure Greg is too. Um, but you know what else is really inspiring, Greg? <laughs> Ariel Cable from GripBlockSystems.com, buddy. Come on, man. <laughs> That's uh, that's one thing you shouldn't question. I know we said question everything. That one you don't because it's way better than chain. I'm speaking from experience. Mm -hmm. Use the grip lock stuff. It's easy to adjust. You can move it up and down. Saves you a ton of money and labor. Good product. You need it. Go to griplocksystems.com. I know I spelled it wrong in the introduction, but uh, we're going to, you know, I'll go for it. Grip, G-R-I-P. Lock L O C K systems S Y S T E M S dot com. Greg Eric, I did it. And of course, that's the right. National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. That's right. We're members. If you got a warehouse with lights in it, why don't you join us? Start making moves with us. And we're getting together 
It's next week. I don't know if that's whatever that is when this goes out, but that's the 17th to the 20th, Greg. Is that what it is? 17th to 19th, Dallas, yeah, Texas? Yeah, right there. Yep. Yes. And, of course, Natalie Rosat. Thank you for coming on the show. And we will post all of her websites, Foscope, Lightreach, and her social media to the Get a Grip on Lighting website. So if you want to follow her, go to getagriponlighting.com and check it out. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.